Um, What's the bad news? <laughs> two, two, two or three quick, uh, quick questions here. Um, you've uh, given us a very simple model with uh, very interesting results, I think. Uh, how confident are you that when you put more complex models when you get some results? Uh, when, you, when you started working on those, um, just a couple of related things. Uh, your model uh, suggests you're getting Kuhn's results not, not from an analysis of history. On the contrary, they're going to produce a, a, a historical hypothesis to be checked. Uh, so you might say your model uh, develops this idea from first principles. Kuhn himself, you know, yeah, he's, uh, he's, in his late work, uh, yeah. sort of rejects history of science, um, uh, except for a, a, a general viewpoint, um, arguing uh, you know, that he's, he's, he's getting his, uh, his new concept of the scientific revolution of speciation uh, from first principles, as he puts it. And so another question would be, are, are you at all concerned with the later Kuhn, and do and, and you think this, there's any compatibility there, or do you think Kuhn just went, went wrong? I mean, I, I, like you, I just spent most of my time on Kuhn's early work, uh, but uh, I just wonder what you think about that. So, for your second question, indeed, uh, Kuhn's later work is very informative in that respect. That he, he, I think the papers called What's Wrong with the Historical Study of Science, which I'm very, very, really dismisses uh, use of historical case studies for the structure of uh, scientific evolution or for study of scientific change. And this, and this I think, is, he, he does rightly because um, basically his claim, the claims he is making about normal science process evolution basically large scale patterns and um, it's very anecdotal so it's, if you use specific historical case studies that's like anecdotal evidence for for example um, uh, an economic uh, recession and so it's like going into the street and asking people are you feeling the recession are you unemployed and, and are you unemployed and, and so using specific anecdotal evidence for to, to make what is almost a statistical claim is, I think, um, uh, n not the right way to go. But then again, he could not do anything else because at that at the time, uh, the structure of scientific revolutions was written. There was no statistical data about science. However, Kuhn anticipated the advent of, of this kind of data. He was even a friend of Eugene Barfield, who was later the founder of, of the Web of Science, which is one of the largest scientometric databases around. Now. And Kuhn actually um, literally states that once this uh, source of data will be there, that will be much more suited for his claims than, than uh, um, historical case studies. So for your first question, though, about robustness to changes, yes. Um, it's actually, um, I've, I'm not gonna, but I've not gone into this, but this is actually a pre-existing model from um, uh, evolutionary biology. Um, where uh, this is actually a model of co-evolution, a PSD system model that I've adopted to Kuhn, but that is, uh, was actually produced by Ben Buck, um, which um, who is a, a physicist, a theoretical physicist, and um, they have checked the, um, the main characteristics of the model against many, many, many uh, variations. And one of the, the reasons why this model is so famous is because it is so robust. So we need it is, even if you, all, all kinds of changes can be made, such as the number of uh, uh, links between the, um, uh, the different uh, practices and things like that. In Per Box model, of course, it, he talks about species and, and it's, about, it's not about significance, but it's what he talks about fitness, of course. But um, the, the, as, as soon as you have the two characteristics from which also I started, namely that um, you take not the uh, best but you remove the worst and that a change can affect the value of, of surrounding um, um, species or practices. From then on you have the qualitative features that I've described. With the more complex models, do you visit the power of distribution? Um, yes, yes. Uh, do you have any comment? Just one last follow-up. Um, Herbach uh, has been criticized, of course, by, uh, by other modelers. Uh, uh, I not see that there is a couple of um, the right now. Uh, who argue that, say, a sand pile model or even a spring model are, are not themselves complex, really, but they're, uh, uh, they're 
sort of accumulated. Well, I guess then you get into the logical discussion of what's, what's complex and what's. Um, well, how do you define complex then? But, um, I think what you have here is that, for example, the barrier that, that's. Uh, well, when, 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 would be a very large span is essentially the same. Whereas if you look at, a, say, a, a Boeing 747, it's, it's an inter complex interaction. Mm -hmm. Very it's complicated. It's not as that kind of thing. Surely the scientific practices are very different too, in the way they mm -hmm. work together. Uh, so is that kind of way? Well, well, well uh, just one more answer. So what I would say is then this, this emergent threshold and then also what happens above it to so the stable networks of approaches and the correlated cascades, it's so the revolutions and the paradigms, you could say, it's something, it's, it's, these are I think features that, that you could say that emerge from a model, it's something that you did not put in it. it. You just start from two simple rules, and then what comes out is something, I, I, I would think, if you, the, of course, even what, what, calls it, what counts as emerging is, is always under discussion, but uh, I think this is one of the better examples of, of, of an emerging property. Um, Okay, well, let me pass on. Let's see, I, I saw uh, Thomas's hand first and then Dylan. You know, <clears throat> kind of thing that um, your attempt to, to reconstruct Kuhn by a Simon is partly at least also or leads to a, to a reconstruction of Simon by a Kuhn. Right? Oh. Yeah. Uh, it seems to me that there are certain features um, which are interesting to explore. For instance, um, Consider the first thing is uh, the satisfying strategies are themselves described by Simon as algorithms. As algorithms, they are not only search strategies, as you said. They are also strategies to determine the correct answer to a given problem. Only that the answer is not supposed to, for instance, in economic context, to maximize the expected utility, but but to to satisfy some satisfaction satisfying. Criteria, right? So first, they are uh, also algorithms, and secondly, uh, I, I have difficulties in, in seeing how Kuhn's favoring of those epistemic values, like simplicity, frugality, and so on, are to be related to the fact that uh, satisfying strategy, strategies are themselves sort of epistemic procedures rather than sort of sorry epistemic, epistemic procedures, mm -hmm. right? You, you're, you are supposed to, to search a certain problem space. Uh, uh, you have stopping rules for when to end the search after three, four steps or so. And you have a decision criteria also that you support to apply. Um, and then uh, finally, what do you make of, of Simon's different or other or maybe related problem of the logic of scientific discovery itself? I, I remember that in this. Uh, from when is it 1978 paper that you cited yesterday, the scientist and problem solver? I just looked it up. There is not a single mention of Kuhn, which strikes no, me as no, very no. odd, right? Uh, no, is is it's there it's on the side of Kuhn? I mean, at that time, uh, Simon cannot accidentally have overlooked that there is Thomas Kuhn, right? Uh, so, what do you make of that? Was there an internal resistance perhaps in, in Simon to, to associate himself with? I do not even, deny, even by the way. I do not deny, by the way, that they have a common enemy, right? Uh, so, well, an enemy with, with common ideas, right? Uh, Simon is opposed to, to to maximizing or optimizing strategies in economics and related fields. Kuhn is re, is objecting to a very similar problem in, in philosophy of science. Mm -hmm. That is clear. Mm -hmm. But over and above this negative foil, what what? There is so much that is different than yeah. that I've seen problems. Yeah, but it's because so much is different probably that they also didn't see the immediate link between each other's work. Um, I think the, the, the kind of interpretation that I've offered of Kuhn is, is I think, different from how Kuhn has been, especially in the 60s, how he was received, how, he was common, how his ideas were commonly represented. Yeah. Um, but the, um, what I've mainly looked at in Simon's work is uh, what, what, what mainly inspired me was uh, his, 1990, his 1955 paper, um, 
the title escapes me. Um, 55, the behavioral model of rational choice. Exactly, yeah, yeah. So where he criticizes the, um, the game theoretical approach, where he says that, well, um, you cannot always assume that there is a given set of alternatives, uh, for example. Not always. That's right, but, but science is very restricted to this claim about that you cannot always do. Yeah. Yes, but then, but then he goes on to, to ask himself, how can you be rational in a, in a, in a situation where there, you might not want to uh, presuppose utility from it, where, where, where the standards for comparing them is, not, is actually not, not given, or, or you, might not, you might not want to postulate one. For example, because it costs more to construct a utility function like that than it you might ever gain from making the right decision. And I think this, this same problem is, is, is happening in Kuhn, where, where, um, where you have that. Simon actually uses the word information mobility in that respect. He, he asks himself, uh, how can you rationally choose between informational alternatives? And, and this, is this, this is basically the problem of Kuhnian rationality. Where also is it in the 1955 paper? Um, this quote is from um, from a review paper in 2008, I have, but I'm not sure whether this quote comes from... It, it is a, it's a Simon quote, but I'm not sure whether it comes from the 1955 paper. I should be there. I have, three, I have three people in a row here, Dunya, and then Anna, and then Yulia. Okay. Uh, I, I, I was still trying to understand the link from Kuhn to Simon, or the other line Simon to Kuhn. So, you say that, uh, you agree with that for, from Kuhn's perspective, this, uh, the systemic values of the five Simon's which he proposes, we can't give any specific content to them unless we go to particular. Yeah, Kuhn even says it's undesirable. Yeah, okay. So when you make your model and when you say we drop the worst ones and you specify the significance, how are you avoiding this problem? Because what does count as the worst? Isn't this paradigm related? But the reason why it has to be vague is that it changes no, no, all the time. No, it's vague, but I don't see how your model keeps it vague. I, see, I, I, I don't see how you avoid that medium point for what counts as significant and what counts as dropping the worst. What are the worst? But, and every right? turn in the model, there is an exact sense in which uh, um, a contribution is weighed by precision and things like that. But what happens is that because with every turn also the, the standard for evaluation changes, it's, it's necessary, it, it must necessarily be remain open because once you, you fix the meaning of precision and you fix the meaning of fruitfulness and things like that, um, you fix the standard of evaluation, no, I, I don't and think that's exactly the force of the model, is that the standard can evaluate. But I agree that what I'm wondering is whether it would happen that from the perspective of one paradigm, you drop the worst one, but from the perspective of another one, this is not the worst one at all, and it should have been kept. So for instance, for Lavoisier, logistic is part and should have been dropped, but what Christy would have done, yeah, Christy but should that's be already at the, you're already talking at, at an emergent level of paradigms and evolution, but basically, in, the, in this model, there's just the world where, where scientists are making contributions to, to certain practices. And, and these practices, for their value, they, they depend on other practices. And uh, for example, um, in Newtonian mechanics, um, certain developments in Newtonian mechanics depend on, um, for example, this calculus. And so if all of a sudden it would turn out that this calculus is, is, is not worth anything, uh, then this would also have repercussions for the others. Okay, but where is, for instance, Priest and Lavoisier in this graph? I'm just trying to figure out how could you... So Priest has these values, and he's working on phlogiston, and all of a sudden he's, he's, uh, he has to, like, he satisfies him. Mm -hmm. So he's, he has the value of unification, which is very important for him, and certain qualitative approaches to chemistry. And now, but, why would he be dropped? But this I is really like a large scale evolutionary model of, of how oh, entire communities of scientists, maybe the entire, sci entire scientific activity as a system, evolves through time like on, on a much larger scale. So this, this will not answer very specific questions in very specific situations. I, I also don't think that Kuhn is, is, is talking about the precise situation. He's talking about patterns, large scale patterns that might be out there that we must mostly because they're on too high level of Well, uh, I don't know how to put in order all the reaction that you can imagine I might have on this uh, thing. Uh, 
and uh, yeah, I wanted to uh, go along, you know, you know acknowledging that uh, uh, what he just uh, noticed that you know there is to be some commonality in uh, in being more realistic, as you say, with respect to some traditional model in their own fields. But uh, you know, uh, in that sense. They also share some limit. I mean, both Simon and satisfying, which is not all Simon. The satisfying model, uh, and um, and for what I know, the Kuhnian uh, view of uh, share some some limit of. You say the, it's the best you can do in the condition of complexity where the traditional model cannot be applied. This is wrong. So it's acknowledged, and I completely share that there is a, actually that was the topic of my, of my very first article that Simon, by the way, endorsed. Mm -hmm. I am old enough for having you know had that Simon uh, yeah. discussed it a little bit, uh, and uh, that was a particular case and the satisfying model, and it's not the best you can do. Of course, it's a model. It's a different rationality. Agree for open problem rather than closed problem, fine. But it's not the best you can do in open problem. That's the issue. But it's no. one possibility, it? and and uh, the, also the the Cunian, uh, I would say, approach uh, for certain Simon satisfied thing is not the best you can do. It's a, a very strong, uh, you know, back move. Some of the problem with this is threshold reasoning, of course, are sour grape fallacies. Just to mention one, you lower aspiration uh, as long as you don't find something. Okay, with this, uh, with this procedure, we will never find a cure for cancer. To say one one thing, you know, it's it's very it's very behavioral, and the reason this is about the similarity, but also similarity in limitation. But the other uh, thing is that Simon hated all the psychosociological explanation of his comment. And so uh, I'm not surprised that he even not mentioned that. Because, and he even criticized Popper in a very brilliant piece, I mean, where Simon, who is a cognitive psychologist in a way, criticized Popper, who is a rational philosopher, for being uh, too behavioral and took psychologists, because he said, you don't have a theory of that scholar. In page 30 of your book, you disclaim the title, and you say that scientific discovery has no logic at all. That was Simon saying. Yeah. Why? Because he said, because Popper himself was sort of, you know, being focused all on the logic of justification, and say, well, discovery, who knows, is the act of God, you know? This is so, what Simon is just, strongly uh, uh, com, uh, fighting against. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in that respect, I think this, the two are far apart, you know, completely different. And while uh, I might agree that they share uh, this uh, acceptability, because uh, uh, base reasoning, but uh, it's sort of very conservative one. So uh, they, <laughs> They, the the both a satisfying model and probably a Kuhnian uh, view produce actually much less innovation than we observe. Uh, in, uh, you know, produce either no innovation or some radical shift uh, once in a century or something like that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's uh, some of my consideration. Okay, thank you for these points. Uh, maybe to that last point first. Uh, so. Um, even though okay, that, about the, um, the conflict between uh, um, Simon as, um, uh, again, as opposing a sociological account of science, but well, I guess there, that's again the traditional interpretation of, of Kuhn, as, which, which Kuhn himself was actually revolting against. Uh, his, uh, um, so the, to put Kuhn in the, in the, uh, on the side of the sociological studies of science, um, I would. Whereas, I would actually, I'm actually rather um, um, position Thomas Kuhn's ideas in the field of um, allocation, as human resources management, almost. Of how do you allocate yeah. 
human resources in science. And then the, the, the basic trade-off there is between exploration and exploitation. So, so it, this happens for an, an individual scientist, but also for scientific communities, is how long, like if you're talking about cure for cancer, um, and you have a certain problem statement. Of course, cure for cancer is a very vague problem statement that's two things. Always uh, assume that a, a, a specific perspective on what you expect, how you expect to reach that goal, uh, it makes sense to, to have a, a stopping rule. Like after some, after some time, you will need to increase the amount of uh, people looking for alternative ways of even formulating the, the goal of finding a cure for cancer. And, and the question is, how can how can you go about that, well, uh, that challenge question. in a rational way? And then this brings me to your first point about, okay, I, I maybe I over-exaggerated the success of, of satisfying account, but whether it's the, I'm not going to say it's the optimal way of, of responding to uh, this more realistic version of the problem of two choice. Uh, I'm, I'm not even sure whether it's uh, literally possible to, to say which one in a problem, in a, in a situation of uncertainty, which one is the best heuristic. I, I can imagine that it changes uh, based on the circumstances. Uh, but um, th so my, let me weaken my point there and say like, what I try to show here and like, what I think is relevant for the Kuhn debate is that I've shown that how, how um, this Kuhn account of rationality can actually explain the success of science. So I'm not saying, and so what comes out here is that maybe science is not the best what it can be, but at least it, it can be a, the set of successful practices that we see today. And of course there are things that might be better, and of course there are, there are things that might change, but um, and this is already far from these claims that um, Science is just a matter of mob psychology where just this mob all, all of a sudden goes into this fad of, of preferring this over that option and then, and then moves away from it. And then, because then you cannot explain why science works. And in this oh. sense, you can, here you can, you can explain why science works. So your target is against the, uh, the, uh, the even more psychological and massive Of course, of we can always maintain that scientists are rational, but, but just the reason why they cannot optimize in a classical sense is because they are faced with an open problem. We, uh, we have an issue of uh, coffee time, um, but I would like to give uh, Indiana the organizer of this workshop a chance to... Uh, I have a question about the model. I mean, I work in the science, I agree with the end result. I mean, the revolution of the outcome of small changes impacting on the practice. So, if I understand your model in a correct way, according to the practice, uh, giving a practice like calculus, this like calculus or Newtonian mechanics, mechanics. That would already be like a whole network of practices. Yeah. That's just how to do this. Yeah, but yeah, I'll give you my end point. So, in my opinion, my opinion, there is a the end result that we're presenting. Depending on the working hypothesis you are using, that that means that you are you are representing uh, an empirical practice at the net. So, uh, and in the end, it is if you move more point, that is transform network by network theory. You can show that if you move more point. The network readjusts itself in a, in a given way, in a certain way. So, in, in a sense, the result depends on the working about the you are using. Scientific practice, practice can be affiliated to a network. And maybe, to me, in my opinion, it also depends on the, on the structure of the network. Because it's not clear to me how can you uh, keep the dependency between factors uh, in Because I mean, it, for instance, it means that if you want to go from this practice to this practice, you have to pass through this practice, always. 
Oh, but yes. But yes. if I could, yeah. it's difficult to me to think of kind of relation for each single uh, practice. Maybe I can go here to here without passing through this point. So it, 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 in, in my opinion, this is the essential in the model to obtain the end result. So I, I'm not sure about this. But right. This relates to the other question about robustness of the model. So, so even if the network structure changes, that is one of the strong things about the model. If even if the network structure changes, so if you would just make it into a random network, a power law network, or even just a full network, whatever you change, um, but even with, with full network, it's, it's not good. Um, that the uh, the smaller distribution remains robust. But then, if you if you're talking about really um, yeah, I mean, it can be right? robust, but I don't know if the uh, if it's going to emerge a result. I, I don't know this because the result depends on the on the structure and flow mm -hmm. of the model. Mm -hmm. I, I agree that the robustness is the same in a sense, but I, I'm not sure that uh, a result is going to emerge if you get, if you change the structure and if you uh, allow different connection between the problems. So, yes, I could even I, I I show it in a, in a very simple, like other network structures would involve um, the different uh, construction of the model, but what I could, for example, do is that uh, instead of it's two neighbors, that, that's um, two neighbors on each side change the value, and then also the, the, the model stands, uh, or take even more. But of course, there will be a cutoff point in the robustness of the model as you reach the finite size of the system. But that, that, yeah, that, that you could also just expand the size of the system, and then the cutoff point would be late. But so it, that's yeah. There is of course, the, yeah, the finite size effect. But, but yeah, but that well, uh, no, thank you. Okay, thank thank you. you.
che non ci sia stata se proprio dobbiamo non possiamo lasciarli qui Thank you.